Okay, good morning. Uh, as Paul said, my name is Jeff Squires. I'm in the server division at Cisco. Uh, in particular, I'm in the NIC division where we uh, make our own custom NIC uh, with our own custom ASIC and things like that. And in particular, I work on the driver side and do most of my work in the MPI side of things, but I also go down into the, the pri provider and the drivers and things like that. But a lot of other people on my team do a lot of that work uh, as well. And so uh, Paul asked me here to talk because we have have written both a verbs provider and an OFI provider and we wanted to give a little bit of a compare and contrast in you know doing both and and why we like one over the other or what are the trade-offs and, and things like that because at the end of the day it comes down to what are the customers looking for and then what are the engineering trade-offs in both building and providing and maintaining those services that they're asking for so a quick overview of our device in itself because some of you may not be familiar with it um, we have our own nick like i said it's, uh, we, we had to give it our, our own name because, uh, you know, you just need a different name. It's a VIC. It's a virtual interface card. Uh, it's converged virtualized NIC. Um, it supports Ethernet, FCOE, and a, and a variety of other things as well. And it's fully conformant with SRIOV, right? So it's got PCI uh, physical functions and virtual functions and the, the whole gambit there. Um, it's our third, what's, what's shown here on the screen is the third generation mezzanine card. It's a, a dual 40 gig card. Um, this is actually shipping now in our Blade series. The PCI form factor will be shipping sometime very soon. I don't know if I'm allowed to say the exact date, so I'm an engineer. I don't keep up on all the marketing stuff. Um, but like I said, it's our own ASIC. It's not like we put a Broadcom ASIC, slap it on a, a motherboard and, and call it ours. This is a 100% Cisco device, um, which is actually pretty key because it allows us to innovate entirely throughout the whole thing. So we don't have to rely on someone else's black box. We are creating the whole thing from ground up and can put in the features that we want. Um, one thing that's kind of different from a lot of other NICs is that we are actually providing operating system bypass to the same Ethernet device that is provided to the operating system. So for example, on the left you have a standard TCP IP stack and it goes down to some Linux ETHX device like ETH4 or something like that. The operating system bypass path to that that we call US NIC or user space NIC goes to that same interface. So you're actually sending and receiving packets over the same interface, which allows for a lot of network simplification, which uh, our customers are asking for. So they can have one wire out, one interface out, or they can do the whole gambit of uh, data center, ethernet kinds of things that uh, many have been used to. But the, the picture itself should be no surprise at all. Again, the TCP IP stack, everybody has seen that for years and years. And on the right hand side, the US NIC stack is a very standard uh, operating system bypass. You involve the kernel for a bit of uh, bootstrapping kinds of things, and then uh, the fast path for the send and receive. Now, the only thing to note on there is the little dotted line between our normal TCP IP driver, the enic.ko or Ethernet NIC, very unique name there, uh, and then the US NIC.ko. They actually coordinate because they are sharing the same Linux Ethernet interface there. This is a, a picture of a Sandy Bridge class server. I'm sorry, an Ivy Bridge class server. It's from the, the software program called HW Local, Hardware Locality. And just to orient you to this a little bit, I know it's a bit of an eye chart here. All the cores are up in the top left and the shared caches and things like that. But the interesting part is the uh, devices that are shown on the right-hand part of the screen. So in the top right are four times one gig LOM ports. And those are not interesting. I just wanted to point them out here. And just so you can see, that's where ETH0 through ETH3 live, right? But the interesting part is down here on the bottom right, where I have my two port um, VIC card here, right? So it's a Cisco 1285, slightly different model than I showed in the, in the prior slide here. But it's got two physical ports coming out of it. And here to blow that up for you, uh, one of them, see that's actually ETH4 and US NIC0. So you can see that they are actually going out the same logical interface. So I've got one big PCI physical function there where the two gray boxes are. And then the green boxes that are underneath it are actually the SRIOV virtual functions where we have resources like um, uh, send queues, receive queues, work queues, completion queues, all that kind of stuff. And I'll get into a, a little bit of that. All right, so that's, that's enough of an overview of our thing. Let's talk about the API, because that's what we're here to talk about. This is a software developers conference after all. Um, and, and I want to be clear that 
the choices that we have made are the choices that we have made because they are suitable for both Cisco, what we feel our customers need, and what our hardware supports and what we want to do. Right? Ver this is not a verbs bashing thing. Verbs is actually a very fine API. We did verbs first. Um, because that was a great way to get upstream and expose these capabilities. Uh, it's especially great if you're an InfiniBand provider, which we are not. Um, and so this led us down to, uh, boy, wow, can we do some other things? Because there's some things that are really limiting in verbs if you're an Ethernet vendor like we are. Um, and then along came Sean one day, and Sean said, hey, I've got this great idea. Um, let's go down a different path where we do more agnostic kinds of things for the network. So that we can have an API that, that does all these wonderful things that we've been doing with verbs for a long time, but let's kind of abstract it a little bit higher so that other uh, providers, other hardware providers can play nicer in it. All these things that, that Paul talked about in, in the first talk, and then Sean echoed in, in his talk, right? So it, it kind of raised a question for us, which way should we go in, in the future? And you really got to remember, we already have a shipping verbs provider. So it's a bit of an investment for us to switch directions, right? We have to not necessarily rewrite all of our code, but we have to re-spin all of our code to you know, slightly different abstractions for what OFI is looking for and so on. So we really took a hard look at, do we want to go with the existing limitations that we've got in verbs, or do we want to go in a new direction? So the next several slides here are kind of past, present, and future of our discussions, like things that we have talked about, things that we keep talking about, um, and, and things that we're looking for towards in the future. So let's do a, a first bit of a comparison here, right? So for verbs, there are a bunch of pros and cons, as with any engineering effort, right? Verbs is very mature, it's very stable, it's been around for a long time, it's got brand name recognition out there, um, and honestly, it's the only way to get OS bypass upstream into the Linus kernel trees, if you want to go that well, right? Um, and we also have a, a lot of investment in that already. Now, its cons are that it's very highly InfiniBand specific, right? And we are, like I said, we're not an InfiniBand vendor, and so our hardware abstractions are just different. Um, and also out there is that if in the verbs world, there's, there's standard verbs and then there's Mellanox verbs. And what a lot of people have done is use a lot of Mellanox specific verbs extensions in their code. So it's not just a matter of supporting you know, standard verbs. You also have to support a lot of the uh, idiosyncrasies of various different hardware out there that don't belong to us and are not controlled by us. And so that's not very attractive. Um, and also the upstream maintainer of both verbs on the user space side and the kernel space side is kind of disinterested these days and it's hard to get his attention and it's kind of hard to get changes upstream. So all of these things are, uh, need to be considered when, when thinking about it. Oh, yes, it is. It, it, it does cover Ethernet. That's right. So my, my distinguished colleague from Mellanox is over there is, is pointing out that, that uh, verbs can also be used with Rocky and iWarp, and that is very true. As I was saying, these are our choices um, and our perspective on it. So uh, that is great for those providers who have continued to do that. Um, I'm providing a, a slightly different view. No. No. Rocky is a, a protocol controlled by a different entity. Why would we do that? That's fine. So uh, hold on. I should clarify. We do not support Rocky in our HPC interface. Okay. Um, but let me, let me go back to this, and I would be happy to talk Rocky and other protocols with you later. Cool? Thank you, Glad. All right, so with LibFabric, um, there are pros and cons on, on this side as well, right? So with uh, LibFabric, one of the pros is that it's new, right? So you can kind of get in on the ground floor, um, and you can design for modern hardware and software practices. You can design for things that are happening now and, and going in the future. Um, it also has a much more general hardware design model, right? As you know, intended. That is one of the primary goals for it. And there's no legacy and backwards compatibility issues yet, right? So again, this is part of the ground floor kinds of issues. Um, and we co-designed with the MPI community, and that was actually very important um, because there are, there are things that MPI, the MPI community has been asking for for a very, very long time, and there's been very no movement on it whatsoever. So it was incredibly refreshing 
to have a networking layer say, hey, MPI, what do you want? What do you need? Right? And there's a very active community. There's a lot of things happening. Now, on the, on the con side, uh, the fact that it's new is also a con, right? Because you have to convince a lot of people that it is a good idea and that you're not reinventing and you're not just second syndroming and you're not trying to be a competitor to you know, an existing well-formed API and all these kinds of things, right? Uh, and also, it doesn't exactly match the InfiniBand kernel verbs interface, which is the one that's upstream, right? So again, trade-offs that need to be evaluated when looking both ways on this. All right, so let's look at some specific instances here. So uh, quite a while ago, I want to say in the order of two, maybe three years ago, I'm afraid I don't remember the exact time frame, uh, when we were doing our initial verbs provider for US NIC, we tried very hard to get upstream the MTUs. Uh, common Ethernet MTUs are 1,500 and 9,000. And we went back and forth with the community for on the order of four to six months. And the final answer was just no. Uh, we, we can't get your your MTUs upstream because of backwards compatibility issues was, was the main issue, right? So we wanted to add 1,500 and 9,000 in there. And the, the problem is, is that the enum on the verb side is, is a monotonically increasing dense enum. And you can't insert a value in the middle. And people are actually comparing you know, the value of the enum, not just the symbolic value of the enum and all these kinds of things. So the US NIC provider on verbs actually has to lie, which is pretty terrible. Um, and MPI has to do some horrible things to map that around and figure out what the actual MTU is of the device because we don't want to restrict our customers. Some customers like doing 1,500, some like doing 9,000, some like doing 5,000. They do weird things, so we have to find out what it actually is. We can't just assume what it is. Um, on the libfabric side, it's easy. It's just an endpoint attribute. It's an integer. Done. Very simple. And again, it's not entirely a fair comparison because it was designed this way on purpose, right? This was actually a known flaw in verbs, and so therefore, you know, it was one of the things that was very deliberately solved on the libfabric side. Uh, another problem that we had is that our transport is based on UDP, um, and UDP is a for has a 42-byte header, um, and the problem on the UD side on uh, verbs is that it expects a 40-byte header, the GRH, right? And we talked to a lot of customers about this, and we said, all right, we're, we're kind of emulating the UD verbs provider here. Do you need the full GRH? And if so, what fields do you need? And we got two classes of answers from, from customers. Some customers are like, oh, we don't even look at the GRH at all. We do our own addressing and all this kind of stuff. Everything is in the payload that I need, and I just discard that first 40 bytes. And the second class of customers said, oh, no, I need exactly the GRH. So I need it to be filled in exactly the way that is you know, described in the verbs documentation. Um, for example, the, the, the test program, IBUD ping pong, uh, fails because our headers are 42 bytes and it, everything just gets sk skewed from there. So we actually had to do some fairly horrible things in our verbs provider. We provided a magic query under the IBV port query that gave back function pointers that allowed us to say, oh, okay, turn on the 42-byte mode, which is the performant mode, so we don't have to do the emulation of the GRH and, and things like that. Now, on the libfabric side, Again, this was a known shortcoming that we brought to the table, and so it was solved right away, right? So the FI message prefix mode allows a provider to say, hey, how many bytes do I want at the top? So it could be 40, it could be 42, it could be 79, it could be whatever you want it to be. It's just there, and then you get the payload from wherever you want after that. Reliable datagram was another one that we looked at because our hardware was capable of that, but on the verb side, it's actually not implemented. So... Uh, it's defined in a, in a variety of specs, specs but the uh, enums and the plumbing and whatnot are actually not there. And so this actually discouraged us from implementing it, which made us very sad. Um, because just the, the, the work of trying to get that upstream to get uh, an uninterested uh, maintainer and all the other stuff, we just kind of gave up and said, forget it. So it just kind of never happened on the verb side. On the lid fabric side, again, not completely a fair comparison because this was brought in right at the beginning of the design process. Boom, you just say the reliable datagrams like Sean talked about in the previous one. That's just done. Now, the hardware model. Um, let's look at this. On the, on the verb side, 
you're, you basically describe things as a, a device in a port, right? And it's usually a physical device in a port, but not always. Um, in, in ours, it didn't really match our virtualized NIC and, and hardware model, right? So if you remember the picture that I showed there before, these are kind of all the resources that, that we have, but it's a, it's a virtualized thing. We usually match this with a physical port, but we don't necessarily have to. Um, so on the verb side, we said, oh, an IBV device and an IBV port are all of these resources combined together. But it got a little squirrely because the queue pairs and the completion queues and things like that are in the virtual functions. And so when you have a queue pair that's in a different virtual function than a completion queue, they can't match, right? The, the queue pair, the bottom most blue box cannot feed the completion queue in the virtual function above it. And so it gets squirrely when you want to have, uh, you know, multiple queue pairs and if they fall over into the next virtual function, then you can't have it feed the previous completion queue and it's, it's just kind of yicky. The hardware model for Lib Fabric maps very nicely to SRIOV, which is, is what our hardware is, such that uh, the FI Fabric abstraction maps to a physical function, the FI Domain abstraction maps to a, a virtual function, and an endpoint you know, matches to the resources in that virtual function. So you have this natural separation of things. So the FI Fabric just matches that, you know, the, the top box in the top right there. An FI domain is any one of those virtual functions. And then an endpoint is, you know, a collection of resources uh, inside any one of those virtual functions. So this was actually a very nice model for us. Um, addressing. This is another thing here. Um, so in verbs, addressing is done by GIDs and GOODs, um, very well known and understood. Um, but there's really no easy way to map back to the corresponding IP, the Linux IP interface, right, to ETH4, ETH5, or whatever it is. Um, the US NIC provider, we did some weird things where we encoded the MAC in the GID. And, and this is the code that actually does this. And then I have to confess, I'm not sure why we did this exactly mapping, because we did the same thing that Rocky did, but I, I'm not privy to why Rocky chose that particular mapping. Um, but that's what it is, and that's what it does. But it still doesn't get you back to the IP interface. Then you still have to iterate through all the IP interfaces, find the one with the matching MAC, and then you say, oh, now I can find things like the NetMask and, and other things like that, BMTU and stuff like that. Again, libfabric, you can use uh, IP addressing directly. There was actually, I, I would say, my same thing. It's not exactly a fair comparison, but there was a lot of discussion about this because there are a lot of different addressing modes. And so there was actually quite a bit of effort put in on the libfabric side to make sure that you could do IP addressing and other styles of addressing. So, boom, everything is awesome. Now, on the netmask side, uh, there's just no hope on the verb side, right? Netmask is something that we need right, to know, you know, where are peers and how do I reach them and things like that. It's just never going to happen on the verb side because that's not a concept that exists on the verb side. So uh, that was another reason why we always have to map back to the IP interface. Now, in Lib Fabric, uh, it could be a little bit better. Um, the, the US NIC provider actually has an exception or an extension, a blessed extension that is upstream in the API, but it's an extension nonetheless that can go directly obtain all this stuff. So the upper level application no longer needs to do this map around, find the Mac, go find the IP interface. You know, usnic.ko already knows all that information and just can give it to you directly, right? So all these kinds of things, the IP net mask, uh, the IP Linux interface name, the link speed, and a bunch of SRIOV attributes and things like that. So it would be kind of nice if this was, if this didn't have to be an extension, but libfabric is a work in progress. Maybe someday we'll convince the community to be able to do IP addressing and the things that it needs in addition to the addressing uh, in, in the main line rather than as, as an extension. Some other things uh, in terms of performance. Um, if you go look at the slides that Sean put out on the OFIWIG page itself, there are a number of things that have just changed over the years in terms of software coding practices that would be really great to update and have been updated in, in the OFIWIG model. Right, so the generic send call, for example, IBV post send, you have to post a scatter gather list, even if it's just one entry. So you have to create a scatter gather, you know, actually, you fill it in, you gotta fill a bunch of fields to zero, there's a, there's a whole pile of stuff that you have to do just to do a send, 
right? And, and Sean's slides lay out uh, all the extra overhead uh, very well. Um, and, and along with that, there's a bunch of wasteful allocations. You have to allocate structures and, and, and things like this. There's no such thing as a prefixed receive, which I talked about before, right? So I want to give so much to the networking layer itself and not the API so that the, the networking layer can stuff things in there. And there's a bunch of branching incompletion. So, oh, I got a completion. Is it this type? OK. Now, if it's that type, it's one of these several subtypes and things like that. It can get expensive depending on what you're doing uh, and just how it's done. Now, on the lib fabric side, again, since it had the, the hindsight of 10 years or, or whatever of, of verbs usage, uh, able to update a lot of that stuff. For example, there are s multiple send calls where, oh, I just pass you a single buffer and a length because let's optimize for that because that's a fairly common thing, right? Um, and there's a variable length prefix retrieve, which I've already talked about. And there's fewer branches in completion. So the error paths have been taken out of completions so that when you do receives, you can just optimize very quickly over the receives and not have to do a lot of extra work, right? Um, I will actually be doing another presentation later today where we, uh, um, in, in comparison to uh, MPISH's first effort for doing more on the easy side of the Open Fabrics integration on Open MPI, Particularly with US NIC, we went with the hard side because we are the vendor and we are trying to maximize our own performance. And we actually get better performance than our, our verbs provider. And I'll talk about that in an hour, hour and a half or so. Yes, ma'am. Right. So the question is, can I explain the faster large messages tagline, really, right? Um, basically, we got a higher top end bandwidth is what it comes down to. And I, I, I actually would like to defer your question because I have a whole second presentation about it in about an hour or so. OK. All right, and then application centricity. I, I heard Paul using the word centric a lot earlier today, so I felt like I had to use it in my presentation as well. Um, this is uh, deliberately a slightly provocative slide because one of the reasons that Cisco got very, very frustrated with the Open Fabrics Alliance, to be completely blunt, was that we were asking for things from the Verbs community and we did it as a representative of the entire MPI community for years and we got nothing. And that actually led to uh, Cisco leaving Open Fabrics. And this is the first year that we have been back since, I think, 2009 or so. Uh, maybe 2010. I'm not sure, but it's been a while. Um, and the reason for it is, you know, memory registration, for example, it's, it's still a problem, right? On-demand paging is a good step in the right direction, but it's still not a solution. The real solution is to get MMU notify, right? There's no MPI tag style matching. There's no, you know, the one-sided capabilities don't match. And the network topology is still a fabric and, and proprietary API. And, and all these kinds of things that really have not materialized on the verb side of things that the MPI community, which is the biggest customer of all of this stuff has been asking for literally four years. There's been a it's good enough kind of syndrome answer that really has not helped us a lot. So on the Lib Fabric side, it was incredibly refreshing that you know people started coming to us and saying, oh, okay, well now what is it that you want? And let's do that, right? And let's not just talk about it, let's actually do it, right? Let's go to GitHub, let's put some code there, let's have people develop code, and let's actually accomplish the things that our biggest customer is looking for, right? So on the Lib Fabric side, uh, I talked about some of the performance things there already. There are many MPI-friendly um, types of things. Like Sean mentioned very early in his presentation, <laughs> there are opposing groups in the MPI community saying, oh, I want super high-level stuff, and oh, I want super low-level stuff, right? Right? So, you know, tag matching you would consider a very high level thing. So those are there. And the one-sided operations, there was a lot of negotiation between the MPI one-sided people and the lib fabric people to make sure that they are a good symmetric match for each other, that you can actually get good hardware acceleration out of this API for MPI operations and so on. Triggered operations, that's already been talked about and so on. And it was inherently designed to also be more than just point to point. That's also another limitation, right? There's a lot of work still to be done. I don't want to say anything about, you know, this is a done and a solved problem and, you know, congratulations, kudos to us all. But really, we're getting a, a big feeling of hopefulness out of this, right? There's a lot of positive movement. There's actual code being written. There's discussion occurring. It's very, very positive, and so we're very hopeful that this is all going in the right direction. So in conclusion, 
uh, again, for us, right? This is what Cisco has decided and what we are trying to do. Um, for verbs, when we were writing that provider, we found that we were having many, many conversations about, okay, how do we take this Ethernet concept and expose it in an InfiniBand-like way? And we would have many, many, many arguments that lasted hours about this, and usually we didn't even come up with good answers. Um, and it was especially problematic with each new generation of Vic ASIC that comes out with new features that have just no corresponding corollary in, in the verbs vocabulary. Um, so, you know, it, it ended up in, in stuff like us doing that horrible port query hack so that we could return function pointers out and basically do extensions in, in a US NIC specific way, which is horrible but, but necessary. So our conclusion was that obviously, since we did, it is possible to do a US NIC verbs provider, but it really wasn't preferable for what we were looking to do. Now on the lib fabric side of way, again, a uh, theme of the whole morning, the API was designed from the ground up to be portable, not uh, an API that was designed for one hardware and had other transports and other things wedged into it on the back end. It was designed from the ground up to be portable, right? And it's still new enough that changes can be made because we are finding corner cases as we go along. I think every engineer in here knows you design something, it's great, then you go do it and you find you have to tweak because there are things you couldn't think of when you were just doing it on paper. Basically, in short, it's, it's much easier for us to match our hardware to the core lib fabric concepts and therefore that seems to be the preferable direction for us to go forward. And that is actually what we are doing. Uh, a little teaser for my, my next presentation is that in contrast to the PSM provider in OFI, uh, the OFI PSM provider is layered on the existing PSM library. Our US NIC provider is actually native, right? So we're not layering it on old code. It is actually the lowest layer that talks to us. So we do get a little performance speed up simply because we're not just layering it on, you know, even if it's just a first iteration, we are actually going straight to the hardware from the, the Open Fabrics API itself. So that is pretty much where our direction is. We are going pretty much all forward in terms of the Lib Fabric stuff because I think it's pretty obvious from the, the presentation we are skewed in the direction of Lib Fabric, and that seems to be what makes sense for us. Any questions? Glad you already had some. How about you? The question is, why didn't we do portals? Um, to be honest, we didn't look too carefully at that. We really wanted to look at somewhat, something that had a lot of industry backing. Intel is a, a huge partner for Cisco, and when Intel approached us, it, it seemed to make perfect sense. There was somebody over here. Yeah. Ah, good question. How do we get to the hardware via VFIO or, or whatnot? No, we do pretty much the same thing that the, the Verbs IB Core does, right? So we expose the queues straight up to user space through the same IB Core uh, stuff down in the kernel. So we did not go the VFIO route. I'm, I'm sorry? Uh, do we have our own kernel driver? Yes, we do. It's the usnic.ko. It's the same, you know, it lives in the slash InfiniBand part of the kernel, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I, I didn't catch the second part of your question. I'm sorry. Oh, right. So the question is, do we support memory registration, and then how does that cross uh, virtual functions, right? Uh, um, Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, our, our memory registrations are in the FI domain, and so they stay within, or where are they, reg I forget. Uh, well, on the, on the first, on the first side, they, they, we map a key to a, a special domain to a, uh, a VF, right, yeah. And so you can't span multiple functions, multiple VFs. Yeah, so I'm saying this for the recording. Uh, there is no way to cross VFs. In, in the FI side, the FI domain is one VF, so the memory registration stays within there. Same thing happens on the verb side, but because of the hardware model, it gets a little more convoluted because uh, Q pairs could spill over to the next VF if you allocate too many Q pairs, for example. And that's, that's a partly a requirement because of the way we use the onboard. Oh, that's a good point. I didn't bring out that, that part at all. W yeah, we, we use the, the chipset IOMMU for the virtual to physical translations, not uh, one that's on the, the NIC itself. 
somebody have something over here? Yes. How do you deal with congestion? Oh, that is a whole question in itself. So the question is, how do we deal with congestion in the Ethernet fabric? Uh, but then you had a second part there. How do we deal with retransmission and whatnot? Uh, congestion, um, I think I'm going to have to defer that question because that's a multi-hour discussion. Um, the retransmission, we actually just do that in software in the current generation of our hardware. So the bottom layer of OpenMPI handles the retransmission. So it's, so it's about the field. It's above the KO, yes, correct. We don't dip down into the kernel for progress stuff. The kernel is almost entirely used for bootstrapping stuff. Vlad? Yeah, just one moment. The entire session is for big Okay, so let me, let me clarify our position. So the, the point is that it is not lib fabric versus verbs. For us, it was because we are resource constrained. We only have so many engineers. So we, it's, it would be difficult for us to do both for all situations, right? So for us, we were looking at you know, if, if we can only spend the resources to do one of these, which one makes better sense for us? And this may not be true for everybody else, right? The, maybe you have lots of engineers that uh, can do that. And so when you pick an API that you want to support, th this was our choice. And I'm not saying it's a good choice for you or a good choice for anyone else. So I'm just explaining our, th our thought process. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yes, uh, other vendors have made other choices. I understand what you're saying, Galad, but this this was our choice. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry. Is it possible to do RDMA? <laughs> yeah. So uh, right now, our our har the software that we have released today uh, that's up on GitHub supports emulation of the EPMSG, which includes the RDMA and whatnot. I would not say it's fully debugged. We are mostly a UD-based transport at the moment. Um, I don't think I should make too many future-looking comments, but I think it should be pretty obvious from my inflection of voice where we're going. But the, the software that's up on GitHub today nominally supports it, but I'll bet it's buggy. Yeah. Thank you.